Hello everyone, welcome to our Wednesday service. And today we're continuing our Wednesday message series of the power of prayer. And last week we talked about how to pray for our nation. And today we're going to focus on how to pray with humility. Now, most of us are much better at excusing our sins and failures than we are at confessing them. We can be quick to point out other people's mistakes. However, we have a hard time admitting when we've blown it. So, to make you feel better, I've listed here some actual excerpts from insurance companies where individuals who had accidents explain what they think went wrong. Excuse number one. Coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that I don't own. Excuse number two. The other guy was all over the road and I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. Excuse number three. I had been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. Excuse number four. The telephone pole approached my car at a rapid speed and I swerved to get out of its way, but it hit me. And then the last excuse is I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law and drove over the embankment. And just as many people can make excuses for accidents that they've been in, there are quite a few people who also make excuses for why they don't pray as much as they should either. So our scripture text from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is going to wipe out our excuses by giving us six significant truths about what it means to pray effectively and with humility. The first significant truth is that we need to pray biblically. Verses 1 through 2 tell us from Daniel chapter 9, it was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became the king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. Daniel had been sent to Babylon almost 70 years earlier and had proven himself as the prime minister under three successive kings. So here in these first verses of chapter 9, I picture Daniel reading and studying his copy of the scriptures, and he at this point was at the ripe old age of 90 years old, and he's reading from the scrolls of Jeremiah. And the part of the book of Jeremiah that Daniel was reading from was actually chapter 29. And he was looking specifically at what we know today as verses 10 through 12. The Bible says this in Jeremiah chapter 29. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. And I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. Well, we know that Daniel and others had been taken captive in the year 605 BC, and that it was now the year 538 BC. So Daniel has been in captivity for 67 years. Daniel recognizes that according to God's promises to Jeremiah, his people only had three years left before they were promised to return to Jerusalem. Daniel also realizes that they are definitely not spiritually prepared. So, he is driven to his knees in prayer and simply reading and understanding the Word of God. 
although things looked humanly hopeless and it appeared impossible that the exile would end anytime soon, Jeremiah now had a firm word from the Lord. And because the prophet Jeremiah had a promise from the Lord, so now Daniel also relied on that same promise as well. This brings us to the second significant truth, and that is to pray with humility. Verse 3 from Daniel chapter 9 tells us this, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. Daniel takes off his beautiful ornamental robes and dresses himself in a simple gown of rough burlap, which was a cloth used to make bags for transporting grain. Now this term, rough burlap, which is also translated as sackcloth, is used 46 times in the Bible, and it's always used in reference as a symbol of grief and a deep mourning. And Daniel took his humility before the Lord even deeper when he sprinkled himself with ashes. This act was a statement of guilt and symbolized a deep repentance. The idea was that a person who is covered with ashes doesn't really feel very clean, and so this was an outward sign of an inner pain and agony. Fasting is also an act of humility that enhances prayer. Fasting teaches you to say no to your bodily appetites so that you can focus on prayer instead. Now, Daniel did not do any of this as a public display of spirituality, but rather as a private expression of his sincerity. So this brings us to the third significant truth, which is to pray with intensity. Daniel says this in verse 3, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him. That word pleaded comes from the Hebrew word bakash, which means to seek and search with an intense focus. The context of the word is actually of the uh, sporting world and refers to a wrestling match where the intent is to subdue and pin your opponent. So while wrestling in prayer to seek and search, Daniel then says in verse 4, I pray to the Lord my God. That word pray comes from the Hebrew word para, which means to make a supplication. However, it's the syntax of the verb in the Hebrew that gives it its oomph. The word is used in what is called an emphatic imperative, and this means that it denotes an extreme intensity. Wow, we sure could all definitely use some palala in our own prayers, couldn't we? Daniel's prayer is filled with urgency and fervency. Ten times he says, O oh Lord, or Oh my God. Now, this word that's translated O oh, is actually an untranslatable word in the Hebrew language and represents a groan. Daniel literally agonized in his prayers as he wrestled in his seeking and searching towards the Lord. Now that's praying with intensity. So this brings us to the fourth significant truth about what it means to pray effectively and with humility, and that is to confess sins specifically. Daniel pours out his heart to God in verses 4 through 5. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. Daniel 
doesn't make excuses and doesn't blame anyone else for Israel's misery. Instead, he admits that the nation of Israel has gotten exactly what it deserved. Now let's drop down to verses 13 through 14. And Daniel says this, Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all these things, for we did not obey him. This is a prayer that needs to be prayed in our churches and throughout America today. When you read Daniel's prayer, you notice that his confession is both personal and collective. He speaks about his sin, even though scripture doesn't record Daniel ever doing anything wrong. Daniel recognizes that he is part of a community of sinners when he says this in verse 5. We have sinned. He didn't say, oh Lord, they have sinned. Daniel recognizes that to be a part of a group that has been punished by God and sharing with that community all that's within them in their lives also shares their sins. And while Daniel may not have been personally liable for the sins that causes people to be sent to Babylon for 70 years, nonetheless, he still took on the responsibility for those sins. Church, we need to take that responsibility for the sins of our nation as well. Because we are much better at making excuses than confessing sin. We live in a no-fault culture where you can get no-fault insurance and no-fault divorces. The mantra of our modern culture is, hey, not my fault. And we've come up with some phrases to excuse our sin. We say, I goofed, I blew it, and we talk about mistakes or weaknesses. The truth is, though, that what we call little weaknesses, God calls wickedness. We need to remember those awesome words of promise from Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. So we need to be spending more time in confessing our sins rather than concealing them. Now Daniel was not only willing to confess his sins, he was willing to repent of those sins, which means an intentional change of behavior. The truth is that there can be no true confession without repentance. They are like uh, spiritual Siamese twins that cannot be separated. So true repentance of sin is not only being sorry for your sins, but also sorry enough to quit that sin. But with that in mind, a true confession always starts with the general and then proceeds to the Pacific. Notice how Daniel starts in verse 5, and he says this, But we have sinned and done wrong. That's general. Then Daniel gives some specific examples of how they have sinned in the last part of verse 5. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. That's more specific. Also, drop down to verse 11, where Daniel confesses to the Lord, all Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. It's important 
to get specific with God because in confession, we are not informing God of our specific sins. What's happening is that we are agreeing with God about those things we have thought, done, and said, which were against his will for us. Daniel admits that the mess they are in is their own fault. Daniel puts the blame right where it belongs, on himself and on his people. So after we specifically confess our sins, we come to the fifth significant truth to be praying with humility, and that is to ask for God's glory. Daniel says this in verses 15 through 17. O oh Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. Oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Notice in verse 17 where Daniel says this in his prayer. For your own sake. Nineteen different times in this prayer reference is made to God, while his people are referenced to only eleven times. Daniel prayed this prayer for the return and rebuilding of his nation, and he died before there, those events were even fully implemented. Daniel wasn't praying for himself. He was praying for God's own sake and for God's glory. So the Bible shows us that the true people of God are people who pray with humility, who bow down in meekness and rise with praise and adoration to our almighty God. Too many Christians today in evangelical circles think of God as just being there for them. However, the truth is that we are here for him. Daniel's petition is, is not making any demands for God's glory. Instead, Daniel's prayer of humility asks for God's glory to be manifest within his people. Daniel's prayer then concludes with a crescendo of boldness as he pleads with God to act. Take a look at verses 18 through 19. Daniel says this, Oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Lord, Listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay, O oh my God, for your people and your city bear your name. Daniel's confession was the result of his deep sense of the majesty of God. In verse 4, Daniel begins his prayer with praise and glory. O oh Lord, you are a great and awesome God. We need to remember that the glory of God is our goal, not ours. So now, we come to the sixth significant truth, and that is to expect an answer. Take a look at verses 20 through 21. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. Daniel received an answer to his prayer even before he finished praying. 
Now, while it doesn't always happen this way, many times when we do pray, God answers us before we even get up off our knees. And that's what happened here with Daniel. That was quick. Sometimes answers to prayer are the fastest things in the world. If we take a look at the uh, book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse 24, it gives us this amazing promise. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Before Daniel could even say, Amen, the answer was there. Friends, when we pray, we can sometimes receive the answer while we are still praying. Have you ever asked God for guidance and direction? And while, while you were asking Him, the answer came as quick as a flash, as a thought in your mind? However, the one thing that we need to keep in our minds, and the importance of our focus should be that God always, always, always answers prayer. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the answer is wait. God says that one to me a lot. God is continuously trying to train and teach me principles in my life which will benefit me, and one of the things he knows I need a lots of help with is patience. So God often answers my prayers with wait. It's immediate, but he says, wait. The thing is, folks, is that we need to remember that God does always answer our prayers. So to summarize, Daniel's prayer begins with a praise for who God is and for what he does. The prayer then moves into confession, which finally leads to a petition. Kind of sounds like the structure of the Lord's Prayer, doesn't it? Friends, let's pray that same way with humility before our great and awesome God. Begin with praise for the glorious character of God, move into confession, and then finish with your requests. When you do, you'll be praying just like Daniel did. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and give you praise as the almighty creator and sustainer of the universe that you not only listen to our prayers, but in fact are always ever eager to hear from us because of your great love for us. Father God, we are sorry when we do not give the glory you deserve and instead treat you as a divine prayer vending machine. Prophet Daniel says it best when he proclaims, O oh Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. Thank you, Lord. And we pray this in the holy and awesome name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
may the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and give you his everlasting strength and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord.